Hello, we are live and we're just on time. <laughs> Yay. How are you, Julia? Did you get a lot done today? Uh yes and no. I killed a big spider, which probably sounds horrible, but it was it was pretty big. And then I did some cleaning and after that. I worked a little bit on my drawing, but I don't know. The day just went kind of fast, honestly. I I understand. Uh, I It went so fast for me that it took me so long just to put together the thumbnail that we basically advertised it as we were going live. It's beautiful. I really love it. And it's a great topic. Yeah, I was thinking that, you know, a lot of people don't know the etiquette of how to talk to artists about art. And I think sometimes people even get their feelings hurt for, you know, just for somebody saying the wrong thing, you know? So mm -hmm. we, I thought we would talk about that. Um, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Um, I, I did want to share a reel, but it was, it just took way too long. Oh. So I'm going to go ahead and show you some of the things that I've recently done. And oh then we'll look at yours and then we'll talk about what people sometimes say, you know. Okay, sounds good to me. Okay, so I'm not going to show everything that I've done recently, but uh, since the last one, you know, this was the last one I showed when I, I was remember, yeah. updates. And okay, do you know who this is? <laughs> it's from that last show correct it's from star trek uh I think, uh I think i saw something about khan oh yeah you i think i remember now khan the wrath of khan yeah. yeah so so i painted this um and you know he's supposed to have white hair i didn't quite know how to do the white hair but can you tell that the white the hair is supposed to be white i mean it looks lighter he almost kind of looks like a a Spanish conquistador, like like a something uh -huh. from the 1800s. That's kind of the impression I get of him. That's that's very good. You know, uh, you know who's playing him? It's uh, Ricardo Montalban. So oh, okay. he could that's definitely cool. be a Spanish conquistador. <laughs> no, no, that's just kind of because I'm not real familiar with Star Trek guys, so I apologize. But that's what it strikes me as. Yeah. You now know, he was he this was very sexy character yeah. from. The old series, you know, he, he appeared in this uh, show called Space Seed, um, and it was all about eugenics. Um, they found this cryogenically preserved Superman, and it, of course, it was uh, played by Ricardo Montalban. <laughs> and um, anyway, they decided that he was trying to take over the world, so they had to shipwreck him <laughs> on this planet. And... <laughs> at a time i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay there was this woman on the on the ship that he seduced by the way and <laughs> uh so she went with him because she was in love with him um and she was a historian in fact she was the ship's historian oh which is really funny because you know okay there's the navigator there's uh the helmsman and then there's the historian right <laughs> <laughs> so anyway she thought he was like a figure from um you know a figure from history and so then the second star trek movie which was really the best movie ever they found you know they accidentally uh stumbled on the planet that they had shipped this guy on oh God. years <laughs> earlier <laughs> my God. And he wanted he wanted his revenge, you know, because his wife had died and, you know, they'd been living under very primitive conditions for a really long time. So he was going to get his revenge on Kirk and company who had shipwrecked him. Um, well, I guess you know, we have to be more careful what planets you land on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's very dramatic. And I used a song by Julia Eckler. Oh, yeah, that's uh, great. Yeah, and uh, it's called The Vow of Vengeance, and it's all about him. And Instagram told me I couldn't use it. You know, I didn't use it myself. I used it in the app. You know, yeah. the app that does the reels. 
they're weird. I went back and I looked at some of my old reels and one of them has been silenced in some countries because I used a public domain song, but they said it's not allowed in Singapore or Indonesia. I don't know. Well, I don't know if you uh, you used that, but you went through the their software to pick it out, right? Yeah, I did. But then it told me it was silenced later. That is very odd let me i hadn't thought about it until you mentioned that the other day because i don't always look at the music i had picked previously but yeah so one of them was silenced in several countries another one was silenced in canada i don't know why okay so anyway it's still available on this channel um as a short and youtube seems to be perfectly fine with it you know, they're the ones who offered me the music. If they hadn't offered it, I wouldn't have picked it, you know? Yeah, that's weird. It's like they don't vet their own or like substantial. That's interesting determination. Right. So then I, I switched gears and I started taking an interest in the poster for the uh, Princess Bride. And this was uh, an earlier version. And then today... Today, I did this version, which I think is better. You know, I like both of them, but for different reasons. I think the other one, it's a little bit softer. It seems like, and this one seems more romantic, and it has, like, a little bit more color to it. So, they're each yeah. a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, I, I enjoy doing that. Um, so, did you want to share yours? Okay, I'll show you what I've done on mine. So basically, I have made a little progress. I probably doesn't look like a lot, but when you yeah, see it, it, it small, looks like a lot. Well, it takes a lot of colored pencil. This is another reason I'm saying that I think I want to move over to paint because this costs a lot of money. And I was thinking about that today when we were talking about it. I don't know. Like, I love the look of colored pencil, but not only the light fastness that con um, concerns me, just the amount of money and time to get the same. I think what I want is I like that painted effect to it. And it's funny because Prisma actually promotes that like on their cover, like, oh, saturate the thing. So you use more of their product. I feel like maybe paint, it's time to go back to painting after this. Yeah. Well, I mean, you work so hard at it. And, you know, I would never have that much patience to, I mean, it's beautiful, but Oh my goodness, you, you put in so much time for that. I, it's because I really want to do it and I want it to look a certain way. And I do have a lot of patience when it's like for certain things. Well, a lot of things, actually. I, I'm a very, I'm very patient when it comes to certain things. I think maybe more yeah. than, like, I like the result, but like I said, I think paint is more economical considering I'm not going to buy a whole kit just a color pencil you know i'm not gonna buy like the whole 50 dollar kit so i was buying like the pencils per like pencil and they're like a dollar 25 i think they might be up to two so i think paint is more economical after this project yeah i and i'm finding that um you know using a, a very simple you know child's kit for watercolor is very economical and useful for me um it's not that i don't like acrylics but you know there's just so many things about it uh, including the mess that i yeah, can't know the messy thing i would be concerning you know what i thought was interesting i looked this up today and i don't know how good it would be but i saw some videos where people are making their own water paint and i was thinking about that like i think they had food coloring or something else i don't um, know yeah, and you have to go buy food coloring. That's I mean, if it, if it were something that if they said, oh, if you have ducks, then you can just get <laughs> something that they create or something like that. No, but no, you know, almost anything that you make at home nowadays, you have to go outside and buy the ingredients anyway. Yeah, that's true. I was just kind of thinking about that anyway. Yeah. So how about we share our uh pet peeves about what we don't like when what people talk to us about our art and art doesn't have to be just drawing and painting it could be writing it could be anything well i guess like 
as a creator, I, I even feel like in a way, YouTube could be a form of creation. It could be a form of creativity. Yeah. What I don't really like, and it, this could be art related too, like, I just don't like it. Okay, I get it. Like a lot of people that are creators, they're, they ask for a request. And I think I've talked about this before, but what I don't really like is I get requests like from people just telling me I should do this. And it would be better if I did that because I think a lot of creators in general and even very creative, like art creators, like they do request things or request art or fan art. And I don't really want to do request things. I think that's my biggest peeve, but it's kind of a weird one given the nature of being a creator. Most people want to do requests because those are popular. Well, I mean, it, it depends, you know, you have to get set limits as to what it would be requested. So I guess I wouldn't mind if somebody commissioned me to do art, but it has to, you know, it probably wouldn't be outside of the sorts of things that I like to paint, you know. Well, that would be reasonable if it were something that like, look, if somebody wanted to request and pay you to paint a Star Trek like portrait, that that would be cool. And I wouldn't mind, like, if it were something that I was interested in. Yeah, that'd be great. But I guess what I mean, like, requests, I mean, okay, you're just doing a YouTube channel. So I guess recently I just, I don't really want to be, like, somebody who just does what people suggest that I do. I guess that's my pet peeve. And that can actually go to art, too. Because I think a lot of people think if you're not doing a certain kind of art that's, like, trending or something, it's just not as interesting. Not everybody, but I'm talking about like what has mass appeal, I guess, you know. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll share something that as an author has bugged me a lot. Um, so this is one of my novels. It's not my first novel. It's not my, um, well, I guess it is my second novel, but it's not my last novel. It's not my third novel, you know. Um, so when i finished writing this novel i told a friend that i finished it and wanted to share it with her and she wanted to ask me um what my next novel was going to be that was what she asked and, and i thought that was that was just so strange you know that that was what she wanted to know that is interesting. Okay. I guess my only question is that she asked because she wanted to know if there was a sequel to this novel. Was that the reason she was asking? Because she liked the story and wanted to see like where it might go. Like, was that her thinking behind it? I don't know. No, no, it was really not like that. I think that she was the sort of person who was always working on a project, you know, um, and her projects were usually performances because of the type of art that she did. Okay, so when you're getting ready for a recital or something like that, you practice a lot, you know, until you get everything under control, you know, all of your pieces, whatever, then you have your performance. Um, and then there's kind of this let down, well, not let down, but you know, you have your performance, you could do really well, then it's over. The whole it's very thing like, um, climatic, I think. Like you just have that, you just come down. <laughs> right, exactly. And then, you know, you don't want to twiddle your thumbs for the rest of your life. So then you start to pr plan for your next performance and you start to practice for your next performance. And that was the cycle that she was used to. So she wasn't, she didn't mean anything bad by it, but that was totally not how I felt. You know, I thought this is my masterpiece currently. You know, I, I'm. It's not that I, I made a vow that I was never going to write another novel, and in fact, I did write other novels. But this was at a particular point in my life. I was 33 years old. Um, I had spent quite some time writing this, not necessarily, you know, sitting and writing, but um, putting it together in my head so that I could write it, and then I did write it. And uh, it, 
I was expecting stuff to happen as a result of this. Um, I wasn't planning my next novel and my next novel and my next novel. I thought this was extremely significant and important and was going to change the world. And so it was just, a lot of deep, like messages and things that you want to convey in that novel. It wasn't just something that go on to next, right? Like it's very important. Right. So I tried to explain to her why I didn't think that was, you know, quite the thing to ask. So I said, listen, if somebody had just given birth to a baby, would you ask them when they were planning to have the next baby? That would feel <laughs> really disrespectful. Like I think a new parent would be like, well, what do you mean? Like, this is my child. Like, what that would feel weird yeah so to me you know i labored over this and this was it's not that there couldn't be another you know but at that moment this was such a big deal and had required so much effort and was the culmination of like a decade's worth of work of course i wasn't thinking right then about what I was going to write next, you know? And that's actually a really great and healthy thing. It just means you were so immersed in what you were creating. You really believe in like the message and the story. It's, it's pretty deep that, I mean, that's neat. Yeah. So anyway, that, that was, that's one of my pet peeves. Um, I, I mean, I, I can see that would be annoying, you know? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, there are others. The other thing would be like, if uh, let's say we have a live stream together, right? Mm -hmm. And then I finish the live stream and certain people have been watching it. And I asked, how did you like it? You know, whatever. And they turn it around and say, well, did you enjoy it? What is that? <laughs> That's interesting. Okay. I mean, I think you were just asking like if they enjoyed it and what part they liked, like, uh, that's different, but okay. Okay. So do that, but I never really get why, like, I feel like they're just kind of not wanting to answer or something. Like when somebody does that, I feel like they're deferring. Oh. Yeah. But there's, there's actually oh, something like, kind of, uh, off-putting about that don't you think well that's what i'm saying i feel like they're deferring like i feel like okay i feel like if somebody asked me that like i feel like they're maybe they didn't watch it and instead of just saying hey i didn't watch like they are deferring and they're like oh well or if they did watch it's just kind of strange like i i don't really i think that's a weird comment but sorry <laughs> yeah yeah so, uh, but I, I think a lot of times people, when they do this, they don't realize that it, how it would strike the other person. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like if you baked a cake and uh, gave a piece of cake to someone and you asked them if they liked it and they said, well, do you like it? It's just oh weird. my gosh, that would be so insulting, especially in some non-American cultures, because basically that would be like insulting the cook. You'd basically be like saying, well, I didn't really like it, but do you like it? And I've had people say a variation of that to me, like, oh, well, if you like something, that's all that matters. Like, it, I'm not saying everybody yeah, has Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's another one, okay? Like, um, let's say you write a song or something like that, and, and, you play it for them or you have somebody play it for them and they say uh yeah it the only thing that matters is if you enjoy it and mm -hmm. it's just it's like um fingernails on a blackboard you know it's kind of rude and in a way it makes me think well okay did that person watch or did they listen? Like they can't offer anything. Like they don't have any constructive thing to say about something they listen to or watch. Like they can't offer anything besides asking, Oh, do you like it? Why? Like, why, why can't they offer the, some opinion about it? I don't understand. Yeah. 
yeah. So, well, anyway, those are mostly my my pet peeves. If you have some other ones, you, I, I'd be really happy. Well, I, I hope I don't ever annoy anybody by just say, like suggesting like, oh, try different art supplies. Like, I hope that's not annoying. I that's all I was thinking. So I apologize if that seems annoying. No, but, no, that's not. <laughs> No, I just, I, because I was kind of thinking about that, but I just was wondering, because there's some art supplies I really don't like, by the way, I was thinking about this, like certain types, like I love ink, but certain types of markers really annoy me. Like when they bleed through the paper, I oh, don't yeah. like that. Oh, that. And I tried once, like I did actually a really beautiful composition drawing of like a Hawaiian sunset. And I did it with my nephew and he, he's a very talented artist, but I think that kind of got him interested in drawing because he's like, oh, we're all going to make one. But you know what was really amazing about him? He's only like six of the time, and he made this really beautiful drawing similar to mine. I'm like, wow, you're really good, Brian. I always knew you were. But the, I didn't like how the ink would sometimes streak on the paper. Oh, gosh, I hate that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm actually game for a lot of different art supplies. It's just that it took me a really long time to figure out how to use the watercolors in a way that was similar to the way I was using acrylics. Um, because what tends to happen to me is uh, if I can't figure out how to do it, then I will end up, you know, just sketching in pencil or ink and then using the other art supplies to color with. And I really don't like doing that because I'm a bad colorist. I'm bad at coloring. So I don't want to be in that situation where I have to color. Yeah, you enjoy the mediums that you feel like you've had more control over. I, I totally get that. I mean, um, I, I was thinking it'd be so cool, like, if a company wanted to, like, sponsor us to try out their art product, like, we're totally game for that, you know? I'm just saying. Yeah. 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 And, and, and the thing is, you know, it might be the case that any art supply – could be used in the way that I like to do that. It just would take me a while to learn how on the Yeah, day. it's a learning curve. And I was thinking yeah. about markers. I don't know, like <clears throat> markers. I just don't like markers that much. Like I, cause they, I was trying to think about this. They streak unless you have like really expensive markers and then you have to spend a lot of money. No markers are just one art supply. I can't get on board with, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I have markers and I have uh, colored pencils and I have crayons, all part of that same package, but I haven't tried the others yet. I mean, to some extent, I like oil pastel, but I also feel like they're really finicky too, because like I like them, but I kind of think I use them in a mixed media kind of way where I end up blending them with like oil and the color pencil. So I kind of do a little, I don't do like a whole mixed media composition, but yeah, I do a little bit of mixed media sometimes if one medium is not giving me the results I want. That's one thing I've done and I kind of just do it. Yeah, I, I guess I don't, I don't like to mix them too much um, other than, you know, when I'm starting to learn how to use something that I might use some pencil uh, just because I'm not confident in myself. But then when I become more confident in my control of the new medium, then I stop it with, I don't do the pencil thing anymore. You just do the paint, which is actually really cool that you can sketch with paint like that. I like it. Yeah, that's what I like to do. So if I ever end up doing it with crayon, it would be the same thing. There would be a learning curve to figure out how to make the crayon do what I want. And if I did it with colored pencils, same thing. Um, but everyone that I've ever seen using colored pencils seems to work at it, you know, laboriously or in a way that, you know, involves intensive labor. And I just don't want to do that for lots of reasons. I think it would hurt my hands. Well, it does after a while. Like sometimes I'm like, ah like i'm pushing so hard and then my sister used to say oh my god like i can hear that in the other room 
Like it is so loud. And I'm like, yeah, it's loud. And then sometimes like, okay, I love this table, but I noticed that the colored pencil kind of made an etch. I'm going to probably restain this table because I got it secondhand anyway, but I kind of made an etch. Like there's a lot of things about colored pencil that can be very interesting. You kind of have to be very, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It puts a lot of strain on your arms, I guess. Yeah, I can't, I can't afford to do that at my age. So I, I don't want to, I, I try to make everything kind of smooth, you know, go like this and, and it doesn't hurt me. Well, I think even like with paint, okay. I feel like this is what I'm thinking. Why I kind of want to go back to doing more paint again is I feel like I can get a really similar result with less product and less pressure. And there's a lot of reasons less yeah. time too really like you can feel like even though i do like the really bright intense color i think i can get that result without spending as much time and the color fastness like i love colored pencil but then i'm thinking gee like it fades really quick if you're not careful with it yeah there's another weird thing about colored pencils i have i don't get like the way that they do them they're not even in the center like Okay, and these are some of the better ones, and somehow they don't put the color part in the center. Like it's two halves, it's of the wood encasing it. So some of them crack more than others. I know it's probably hard mm. to see on the camera, but I'm like, why is that? Like, why can't in 2022, why can't you have a machine that puts it directly in the center so it like doesn't break? Like I have a lot of interesting thoughts about that. And then when you go to sharpen it. It's kind of annoying because I'm like, well, why does this side, like, okay, it's probably hard to see here. Like, this side doesn't really sharpen as well. It's hard to see on camera. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's yeah. because it's not evenly centered. And it, for years, I thought there was something wrong with me. But then recently, I saw a video and they said, oh, yeah, Prisma colors aren't perfectly centered. That's why it does that. Well, uh, do you think it would help if you used just a regular pencil sharpener instead of a, an electric one? I mean, I could, and I've done that. Sometimes I do. I have my regular one in the other room, actually. And sometimes I do. The only reason I use the electric one is because it kind of gets the point a little bit finer. And this is another thing with pressure. You kind of have to push harder with the manual one. And sometimes it was oh, really cool. yeah, I, I think Yeah, I think that's another reason why I couldn't use colored pencils seriously is because I have a tendency, if I do push hard, to break the tip i just oh i go through a lot of tips and i've broken a lot it's not cheap and i feel like like we were saying if we're not doing it as a vocation we're not being paid for i kind of want to go to paints more that's just what i'm thinking more lately yeah yeah so i mean the thing that makes me happy about this is i just feel as though it gives the impression of what i wanted to have there without making me spell everything out. You see what I'm saying? Well, I think that's the beauty of art, right? Like you get to like express yourself without having to say everything, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's also like good writing, like isn't like, like isn't a good writer supposed to be able to convey meaning without having to say, sir walked in and describe every like, color on a suit or something i mean with yeah I yeah yeah i exactly i skip all the stuff that i didn't think was necessary and and uh yeah and there's a beautiful way to telegraph what it is that's going on and imply things without saying them so yeah i like to do that with the painting as well i think that's great you know what i find funny though it's funny because they always say well good writers can do that but recently i like had tried to read a book that's considered popular and there was so much detail in there that just was, it was just bogging the story down and I just didn't get it. I'm like, I don't think this is very good writing, but I just was like, whatever people seem to like it. So I just shined it on, you know? Well, I haven't, uh, I haven't read anything recent. Um, I went back and reread Madeline Langle's A Wrinkle in Time, though. But that's a, that's an old classic. And it's pretty good. I'll tell you. I, have you read it? I never read it, but I know it's a classic. And I know a lot of kids read it like in fifth grade. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I read it with my brother. And 
you know, we're, it's a 12 year uh, difference in age between us. And there's a little boy in the story um, who was a lot like my brother. Um, you know, he's a five-year-old genius. And um, so there was a lot in this that uh, we could identify with at the time. To tell you the truth, the best part of this book is the realistic part. You know, it's supposed to be science fiction and they go off to save the world and all that. But the best part is right at the beginning when they describe the family, the, the, the family environment and, you know, just how they live and how they drink hot coffee. I mean, hot oh. chocolate, you know, and, um, you know, how the mother who is a scientist is cooking stew uh, in her lab while she does an experiment. <laughs> things like that um that was fun and then when they met the the boy next door so to speak um who turns out to be uh friend material that was great and then all this stuff where they go off to a different universe and do all these other things i suppose there wouldn't be a story without all that but that wasn't my favorite part you liked the family dynamic and the more realism. That's kind of neat, though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there can be parts of books that we like without liking the whole story, I suppose. I think that's okay, right? To take certain things yeah. from the story without loving the whole content. Right. But then I, I, I decided I wanted to know what other people thought about Madeline Lengel and about this book. And so I read this article by, I guess, a woman writer who had been a fan of Madeline Lingle when she was a little girl. And she had like read all the books that, she, that uh, you know, Madeline Lingle read a lot of books. Yeah, I've and seen that. I've seen that there's quite a few of them. I just, honestly, I haven't read them. That's probably bad, but I just, a lot of people oh. have, I just didn't. No, no, I don't. Don't worry. I, don't, I haven't read them all either. <laughs> I'm mad if you haven't read the books that they've read. I've had people have that reaction like, well, I read that. How could you not have read that? And I'm like, no, 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 no. It wasn't like that for me. No, I know. I know you're not thinking that, but that's just the reaction I get sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's just weird. No. First of all, I'm not a dyed in the wool Madeline Lingle fan. And even if I were, um, I don't think you have to be. <laughs> no, for and, sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I have not read all her books. There were way too many of them. In this yeah, she's book, very prolific. We'll put it that way. <laughs> in this book, there's like a genealogy at the beginning, somewhere in here. I think that's kind of funny. Of all her fictional characters who seem to be interrelated. I don't oh, know if you can see this. Interesting. <laughs> okay, wow. She she's kind of intense. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So they some of them are are in different universes, but they cross over. And in this book, you know, Meg is the older sister of the genius brother, and she meets Calvin, who seems like a really nice guy. And you can sort of tell that they are maybe destined to be romantically involved, but they're too young at that point. Yeah. Well, over here in their family tree. Um, you can see that Calvin and Meg got married and they had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, oh my. Okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's, that's great. Sounds like okay. <laughs> big family. Right. Big family. And now he was one out of 11 and she was one out of four. So I guess they compromised. Yeah, it sounds like it. Like, let's meet somewhere in the middle. Although people told me three was just a giant number of kids. And I'm like, okay, well, two generations earlier, it wasn't. But apparently when I was growing up, it was just like a herd of three children. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think th three children might just be ideal. I, I think it's actually good in a way because each person has their own personality and yeah, it's very interesting. And I don't know, but I never had like, okay, this is not art related. Some people assume that don't have 
siblings, they say, well, siblings always are really, really close and they all get along. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no, it's not always like that. <laughs> oh, definitely not. Uh, yeah. But interesting, like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt what you were saying about the lady in, who read the Madeline Ingalls. Okay, so she... Okay, this is not me. Please don't 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 think that I'm that that woman. But anyway, she had read every single uh, book by Madeline Lengel, and she was like sort of besotted with her, like she was a, a real fan, and she wanted Madeline Lengel to like her back, you know, and um, <laughs> and she she started to describe this Austin family thing. I think I once tried to. Right. Read there's another series not it's not the uh wrinkle in time series but there's another one and it's this austin family and there's doctor this and this is that and they have so many children and anyway the the way it was described by this woman in her article is vicky is this perfect girl you know and everybody does uh, you know she's the character in the story uh, everybody says, oh, she's so much better. She might not be the most beautiful, but you can see on the inside, she is so perfect. Look at that other girl in the family. She's really pretty, but she's so shallow, you know, and on and on and on it went like that. And um, so she always wanted to be the Vicky uh, because, you know, in all the books, it was always like this. And um and okay, what what my point is? So she she finally she went to a a place where uh, Madeline Lingle was giving a reading, and she brought some books to sign, and her mother gave her uh, a wrinkle in time. She was embarrassed to ask Madeline Lingle to sign that because everybody was going to bring that book, and she wanted to show that she was a special fan. So she uh, she brought an obscure book, you know, to to show how, you know, how wonderful she was. She read all the books, um, but she had to bring a, a wrinkle in time as well because her mother told her to. Um, and anyway, she didn't get the attention she wanted from Madeline Lingle. And um, she when she finally got called on, when she was asking questions, she asked, how long did it take to write? Uh, a, a book and Madeline Lingle said, well, it depends, a really long one, like a wrinkle in time, about a year. <laughs> and um, it was not what she was expecting, but she was a little girl at the time. She thought a year, oh, maybe I don't want to be a writer. <laughs> she thought that was a long period of time. Um, but then she went back and she read A Wrinkle in Time and she was crying when she finished reading it uh, because she realized that all those other books with the Vicky character in it, they weren't really, you know, now they mean nothing to her, but A Wrinkle in Time still means something to her. So that was the article by this woman that I read. Hmm. But you know, what actually occurred to me is, okay, I do understand the underhandedness of the Vicky, you know, complimenting Vicky and that she's so wonderful. And Vicky might in fact be a stand-in for Madeline Lingle, you know, in the story. Mm -hmm. But then it made me wonder about how a wrinkle in time is read by so many people and they are not offended or hurt by the, you know, there's, there's this kind of undercurrent where, you know, all the people in that family are brilliant, you know, and yeah, very smart and yeah. And even Calvin, Calvin, who ends up marrying Meg, he comes from a family with 11 children. He's number three. And he describes his mother as being sort of illiterate and mean and nasty. And, you know, there's, a, it's a class issue, I think, you know, it just, it made me think 
you know, that, and he was like, I'm a sport and a sport is somebody whose genes are different um, from the rest of his family. And that brings mm -hmm. something new and better, which is almost like the eugenics of <laughs> Star Trek with uh, Wrath of Khan. Okay, that's you know okay, that's interesting. This is an interesting conversation. Oh, yeah, I, I don't know. So when I was reading uh, A Wrinkle in Time, I was it was very easy to identify with that family because it was a lot like my family. But now I'm wondering how can everybody identify with it, and aren't some people at least offended? by the underhanded stuff, which I think is a class thing. Um, I mean, they might be, but then, I mean, are we going to be offended by everything? Like if people identify with certain characters and certain families that are similar to themselves, I, I just feel like that's an exercise. Of no, 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 no. That, I, I'm not saying other people should be offended that I identify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not, not, that's not my question. You know, I'm also an author, so I'm wondering about how exactly Madeline Langle managed to get the readership that she did, and how other people were able. Oh, to like people that have different families than hers. Like, yeah, is exactly. It the science fiction angle. Do they like the science fiction part of her stories more? Is that the aspect that they? I don't know. Like, what do other people like about her books? per se. I, I don't know. So Madeline Lingle is sort of straight laced Episcopalian. Mm -hmm. um, so if you know C.S. Lewis, she's somewhere in that. Yeah, I get the impression she kind of is in that same vicinity. And I, I've kind of interacted with people of this mindset. Honestly, I'm not exactly offended, though, even though no, I'm, I'm not asking you to be offended by anything. I'm I'm just trying yeah. to understand how other people, you know, not me, not you, just readership. Readership, like, like, well, let's say, okay. Well, for example, I guess what I could, the only thing I could think of is if there was somebody that came from a family similar to Calvin and they had a mother like Calvin, do you think some people might be offended if, they came from that type of background. Like, I well, guess. I'm just... well, let me let me tell you how she's described. So for one thing, she's had all of her teeth and her upper um, in here hold. OK, so she why would that happen? Well, that's because you're poor. When you're poor, you sometimes can't get the dental care. I mean, I yeah, I've heard that. I mean, I had a dentist tell us once that, well, when I was a kid, oh, you're lucky that you're able to see the dentist because we have to turn a lot of people away. Yeah, I get that. A lot of people can't afford to have their teeth. Hmm. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, because I've seen this around here. I, I know that poverty and bad teeth, I mean, it's not that I have good teeth. I don't. But I always gone to the dentist when I needed to, you know. Yeah, of course. Like, yeah. So, you know, I don't know. I think there's prejudice against people who don't get dental care. Uh, there, oh, there definitely is. I, well, one thing people say is like, they're low class, they're not educated, there's something wrong with them. Like they kind of look down upon people that are missing their front teeth. Like that is one thing I've heard quite a bit. Yeah. And we don't know the whole story as to why or what, why they weren't able to go to the dentist or there was actually one man who, I don't know, dental hygiene wasn't really high on his list of priorities, but he did have a master's degree and he was an engineer at one time. He just wasn't big on hygiene. Okay. All right. Yeah, no. And I'm not trying to go really deep into any of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just saying that I think that's a marker of class. Yeah, uh, it is. You're right. You're absolutely right. So, I can totally understand that Calvin would be ashamed of his mom, but I would think that by the time he grew up, maybe he would change his mind about that, you know? Yeah, for sure. And like realize, well, my mom did everything she could for me and I'm lucky to have the opportunities that I have to maybe seek a better financial. Yeah, I think so. Right. 
Well, yeah, it's not even about financial stuff. It's it's about uh, at that moment he's ashamed of her of because of the way she behaves, the way uh, the things she doesn't know. She's the, very the way, ignorant, very low class in his mind. Yes, exactly. Um, but I, I'm thinking about all the kids who come to school and maybe are being told now that they have to read this book. You know, at the time when I read it and my brother and I read it, it was not a school project. It was just, we wanted to read the book. We just wanted to. But I know right now it's being pushed on people too. Um, That's what cool. I heard. Yeah. I, I know some schools, like it's part of the curriculum. Right. And the moment that happens, they don't really have a choice anymore, whether they read it or not. Um. So I'm just, I, I'm wondering as an author, you know that my first book is called The Few Who Count. Mm -hmm. And some people are offended by that because how dare you say that not everybody counts. Um, and, you know, so, so that's an issue. It's an issue for me as a writer and as I went along. So that's why in Vacuum County, I decided I was going to um, go out of my way to do different classes and different types of people i mean like, i understand like you want to do a diversity of characters which is actually really commendable not all writers do that even today so you know yeah but i mean the first one it was just about how certain you know people feel alienated uh, um and they just can't talk to everybody and not everybody can share their values and whatever so yeah. they go out and they look for people who are more like them and I kind of actually can resonate with that idea. Like, I will tell you many years ago when I first read it, because I used to be kind of married to a certain political mindset, I think like I maybe I was offended by the idea that somebody could be anti-union. But then I kind of changed my mind about those things. And I I kind of would encourage people to be more open minded about those things. And I realized, you know what, I actually like the characters and they're not. Like you can kind of identify with certain things that they are going through even. And I, I think people get too close minded about their own situation in life and they don't try to open their minds. And that can come from all sides of the spectrum, by the way. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if that, if what I have to say about that helps or anything. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could totally understand that anybody who, is in a like a, a little college town all and has would would probably re, you know find this very appealing you know i i'm just wondering how did she get the rest of the people or how do the rest of the people feel no it's good to know and it's good to ask how do the rest of the people feel i could share a story with you i don't know if this relates but okay I, I don't teach anymore. I tried to teach on several different occasions. And one time when I taught at this one school, basically I had this teacher telling me that she told the students because she had grown up like very poor and they had had their utility shut off that they could identify with her more than they could identify with me because they had been through poverty together and I just couldn't like go through what they were going through. And I found that kind of insulting actually. Wow. I thought that was kind of strange, but let me kind of um, reiterate. There is that mindset nowadays. I think people forget that we were an immigrant country and people came here with nothing. And they, at one time it used to be, you could make a living for yourself by coming here and you could come here with nothing and go to being the owner of a company. And I think people forget about that. Yeah. Not yeah. to make it political. I don't want to get into the political part, but I feel like sometimes when it comes to art, like only one viewpoint is being taught. And I hate to say it. It doesn't matter what side you are on the American political spectrum. Liberals and both conservatives are not very good at looking past an American viewpoint. This is just true. It, it just really is. Yeah. 
or any kind of viewpoint. I, I, that's all I can offer on that. So I could be totally wrong. I don't know what you're, where you're going with this, but that's just my insight. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's, there's a lot of weird stuff that teachers now think. Um, so when S.W.O.R.D. was in school, uh, they asked the kids if they'd ever seen, been taken to see a musical because they were, you know, the, they were taking the class to see a musical and nobody raised their hand. So she didn't either, even though, of course, I'd taken her to see a musical, <laughs> you know, but she felt uh, she didn't want to be the only one who had seen a musical. So. So she kept that's her hand. Kind of horrible that she had to feel that way. And on the other side of the spectrum, that's another thing I kind of want to say is I know some people they they are not rich by any means, but they're very much into culture and they spend time like reading books, going to small productions and musicals and things like that. And they they spend their time seeking that out, seeking out the arts as opposed to, I don't know, going home and playing video games. So I feel like if you want to seek out certain things, you can, no matter what social class you're in, you know? Right. Yeah. But the, then the, the teachers were a lot, they were sort of bragging about it. Oh, we're taking a class full of children who had never seen a musical to go see a musical. You know, that's strange. Why, why did they have to put it that way? Why didn't they say, okay, this is an opportunity for you to see a musical. If you haven't, like, I just feel like there's a better way that we could, well, you, you don't have to even say anything like that. I mean, I remember uh, way back when I was in uh, fifth grade, and I had a great teacher, by the way. And at the time, we uh, I had been away from uh, the United States for two years in Israel. So even though I'd known English before, you know, I had to cut. I was a little rusty and all that. She was a great teacher. And she... Um, and... Uh, we were taken to see My Fair Lady um, because this other music, the music teacher had a, her husband was in the play. And so we got to see it in dress rehearsal. And it was really great. But nobody talked about whether anybody else had seen it, you know, whether anybody in the class had seen a musical before. It just never even came up. Yeah, you just did it. Like, you didn't have to be like, I mean, that's a good point. Maybe the way she did it was better, right? Yeah, yeah. And of course, I had seen a musical in Israel, but that was my first musical in the United States. So, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of like that. I think that's neat. Like, just take the kids to see the musical. Don't make a big deal about it. Like, just if you want to share that cultural experience with them, do it. Don't yeah. You know, in our community, anybody can go see musicals and plays. And that's actually like what the whole Redlands Bowl is about because they put them on for the public. Anybody can go see them that wants to. It's there. Yeah. Uh, I, I think anybody can read a book who wants to because there have always been libraries, lending libraries, even when they were not public. Yes, um, exactly. And there's always been patrons of the arts that would sponsor somebody that was a pain like there's always been a way to do things in the arts if you want to right right yeah i don't Could, know sorry maybe my way of seeing it like maybe i'm not getting exactly i hope i understand what you're sharing yeah yeah no i i think i think you do understand and that was really the only point that i wanted to make i i don't know i think we were talking about uh, reading books, and you said that you were reading a new one, and I said I read it. I reread an old one, but uh, did you want to talk about the new book that you're reading? Oh, um, well, the new book I'm reading, I don't have it with me, but it's just about the Persians. I'm still reading the Empress to the East. Like I slowly read a little bit that, of that here and there. I used to read so quickly, like I would read like I don't know 100 pages a week or more, like a whole book. But I find that, I don't know, this is a bad reason. Maybe because I go on the internet too much or something. <laughs> oh, there are books on the internet too. Yeah, no, I mean, I read articles online, don't get me wrong. But uh -huh. before social media, I think I just sat down and I would just read like a handheld book. But I'm always reading things like 
well, for example, like about the Ottomans, like I'm always looking up things about the Ottomans. I'm always reading new articles and I've actually learned quite a bit in the last couple of years about the Ottoman Empire. I think I have actually kind of given myself an education on the whole concept of the Ottoman Empire. And I did finish that book about the Ottoman di dynasty. It was pretty dense and it was so interesting. This man went to Istanbul, but it if you apply to go to Takapi Palace, which is now a museum, you can only research the topic that you asked them for permission to research on. So it was so funny. When he went, he was researching something about the dynasty, but he said he was all great jelly jam of people who had picked another topic. So he would kind of like peek at what they were looking at and take notes. So he could write it for his book. I think that's <laughs> such a, a funny concept that you have to know in advance exactly what you're going to research because my favorite thing about libraries is i would come in looking for one thing and then i would you know i would find something else and i would yeah you, know, you would like a general library or even a historical library yes the reason it was so strict is because this is the manuscripts that are kept it to to copy palace which belong to the dynasty so they have people taking care of them and they're very picky about like you have to apply in advance so they know that the document's not going to be like touched too much and just for i guess their preservation reasons I, i'm not sure the rationale it doesn't really make any sense though it's kind of weird yeah i don't yeah, think I, it makes yeah. any sense like why don't you digitize them or something like so people can read them online if you're worried about people handling them. I just thought that was kind of funny. You have to ask in advance. Well, eventually, I guess he asked to see other topics. And but it was a very interesting book because I, I learned all about how up until Suleiman, there's a reason he's magnificent, by the way. Not only was he one of the longest reigns, he was one of the strongest sultans. And also this was the time when the empire was expanding. But by the time you hit his son, they don't really have anywhere else to go. So what happens when an empire stops expanding? They kind of fall in on each other. And then you just didn't have strong leadership after that. And, and the thing that was really interesting about the book, it was saying, well, you know, the Ottoman Empire was part of Europe. People forget that. And it was just showing like how there's a lot of commonalities between Balkan and Greek and Ottoman culture that people like kind of deny. And that the British had a strong trade with the ottomans actually it was very fascinating it was a good book but now i'm reading about the persians and this book is so fascinating because i guess previously other books written about the persians are just based on documents that the greeks wrote about them but this particular researcher has gone back to persopolis and found different like it's hard there's not a lot but they're mostly royal decrees but he's trying to find like first-hand documents like in the Kanea form to like document what their life was like. Wow. It's a lot of archaeology. And I do like archaeology sometimes. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, the, uh, I would be fascinated by that too. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of articles online without even having to read. The, that's another thing too. Sometimes when I'm reading books, I just look things up and I'm reading a lot of articles and I get lost. So I don't, I'm not part of the contest where people are like, reading 300 books in a year i just want to like understand the topic well that's yeah, kind of no, thing. I, I don't think we have to have a contest with other people about how many books we read that's ridiculous oh but this is the new thing like how many how many pages do you read like it doesn't matter like if you're interested in the topic like it's just like pages and numbers and i just can't get on board with it i guess i don't know yeah, I was never like that. I just want to read something I enjoy. I I did like your fiction books. I like some historical fiction. I'm not reading as much fiction anymore because the last thing I read that was really popular was really strange. And I don't want to diss like fiction, but I feel like like classical fiction was so good, but I don't like modern fiction really. I think I told you one of the last books I read how it ended and it kind of upset me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I couldn't. So I'm reading just more history now because I just like history. And a lot of history books have archaeology and a little bit of socio. It's just, so, yeah. Another thing that's really fascinating about this book that you would probably like, um, they're showing the different, like they're talking about Indo-European and they're talking about 
proto um, Persian and the similarities between different dialects. It's very interesting. Yeah, I would be interested in that as well. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, so that's what I'm reading at the moment. Yeah. And then Post of the East when I have time or when I make time for it. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. That's plenty. I mean, I try my best, but also, too, here's the thing. Like, I do read articles online. I, I mean, so when I go online, I'm reading. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you're writing, like, like for publishes lately. You've been writing more. I saw you wrote something about flowers. Yeah. Well, I was, I was sharing uh, the information that I got from Kathy Freeze, who was my guest on the live stream on Friday. She was very good. Yeah, I started listening to it. I really enjoyed how she was saying you could take care of certain plants that sounds like they're invasive and not native to a certain area. Yeah, yeah. I have a slightly different uh, approach to my land because I'm just letting things go, you know, on half of my acreage. And what I'm getting is a, a woods, woodlands Um but what she's doing is very wonderful, too, because she's creating meadows and prairies um, for the pollinators. And I, I really like that. That's really cool. I kind of like how there can be different approaches. That's just really yes. nice. Another thing I wanted to mention, though, just about some of the imagery was I thought it would make a very beautiful painting, like a landscape. Some of the things that she shared, like with her flowers. I just. Oh, I yeah. Like, I love the Indian um, uh, paintbrush. Those are, I, I, red is my favorite color. So. We, we had those up in the San Bernardino Mountains. They're very, and they're indigenous. There is a variety that's indigenous. They're very beautiful. Yeah. I think it would make a great painting. I, I don't know that I could do it because I'm not much of a landscaper, but maybe you. I mean, I, I kind of do want to get back into doing landscapes, but I go through phases. I was so big on landscapes, like for, I don't know, from the time I was a teenager up until maybe I was 30. Landscape, landscape, landscape. And then all of a sudden I wanted to start doing cats, but they would have a landscape behind them. And now lately I kind of want to do people because I didn't draw as many people. So I don't know if I want to draw another person next or an animal or a landscape. I'm not sure right now what my next art project is going to be like, you know how I always say I have visions of certain ones. I don't have a vision of one past this one right now. I just had a vision that I needed to do this, but after that, I don't know. Well, that's right. We don't have to always know. Um, I don't think you have to have a plan. I think it has to come to you. It comes to me in like flashes. Like I just really felt like it was important that, I draw harem sultan and i also felt that it was important that i learn more about the ottoman history i don't know why but it's just it's really pressing upon me even though it's interesting because i think like in my you know it depends like some of my ancestors were probably pro-Ottoman. Some of them are probably anti-Ottoman, but they lived during the Ottoman Empire. I think that's one reason I've, I'm very fascinated by it, because I know that our family did live there, and I just it something about it, like if I could read Arabic, I would love to go back and research and find out. But I heard there's still Byzantine jewelers in um, Rashi of Lebanon. I'm kind of fascinated by that. Yeah, wouldn't it be great if everything changed in Lebanon and you know, it it would be easier to visit there. Well, you can visit there now, but I can't. I mean, know? I could if, like, I had unlimited income to go places and time to do whatever I want. But I feel like the Lebanese people would like people to visit there. I don't, it's governments, you know, it's governments that make these dumb policies. Because I don't think, you know, actually what I thought was kind of cool, like, they were always promoting like animosity between different people. But there was this one National Geographic article that made this thing sound really bad. It was talking about how Palestinian Israel is really antique, um, like gray robbers all got together to make sales. And I was thinking, well, how come these people can all get together, but they <laughs> everybody else is fighting. And then this article pointed something out 
that the people don't really like government policies as much. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of the way I see it. I don't think people feel that way. You know, like Nassim Taleb doesn't feel that way. He's friends with people like from many different countries. And yeah. yeah. He also has good things to say about the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. I mean, look, okay. I think what happened with the Ottomans, I was going to talk about that towards the end, something really tragic did happen. It was, there was an Armenian genocide. Yes. And, but it happens to the Assyrians too. And what happened was you had a few people towards the end. They just were kind of, it's interesting. It gets into this topic of eugenics. Like they started reading up on eugenics, like the whole mm. eugenic research in Europe. And they started getting some weird ideas like, oh my gosh, we need to make sure everybody's like, like, like loyal to us. And I'm not, what happened was horrible, but I think we made a mistake by not like respecting Suleiman the Magnificent because during his reign and his father Salem and before that by Zed, they actually took people that had been expelled from Spain and Portugal who were forced to like give up their religion and they let them come to the Ottoman Empire and practice their religion. And why don't we give respect to that? I don't know. Yeah. That bothers me that they're trying to make it always seem like, but there was a lot of really tolerant and good things that came out of the Ottoman Empire. And we also have to keep in mind too, the U.S. has done similar things like that to the Native Americans. So who are we to criticize the Ottomans when we did the same? You know what I, I mean? I just, I'm just saying, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I think we can criticize anybody who does that, including the Americans, okay? We can criticize the Americans. We can criticize the Ottomans. We can criticize the Chinese for what they're doing to the Uyghur people. I mean, we should just yeah. criticize genocide, period. We shouldn't make it politicized. We should just say that's wrong, you know? Yeah, of course. Of course. But anyway, I guess that's just a story about what I'm reading right now. Yeah. So are you going to study Turkish? Are you planning to study Turkish? Uh, I'm studying it just by watching the show and listening to the show and picking up a few words here and there. I thought about taking Turkish lessons, but the thing about that is it's a time commitment. And I don't want to sound completely lazy. I just don't know if I'm going to like sign up to take a lesson, like a language lesson yet. <laughs> Yeah, no, I understand that that could also be expensive. Uh, but, you know, you could just pick up a book in the library, like teach yourself Turkish or something like that. The sad and thing is we don't even have books. Turkish is that obscure. Like you have to kind of buy, I would have to buy one. And that's what I'm thinking about next is just buying myself a book teaching myself how to read Turkish. Although this is what I've been doing. I can go on Google and if I hear a word on Magnificent Century, I've started to type it in. And I understand a few basic words like Evet means yes, Anya means mom, Baba means father, um, Yazik means pity. Like I'm picking up a few basic words here and there, but I would have to buy myself a book if I want to yeah. learn. Yeah, hey, you, you want to learn the grammar. You know, the grammar is really neat. I need to purchase a Turkish grammar book, like a basic, I don't know, Turkish for dummies or something, probably. Yeah, I, yeah, think, I think I I have one somewhere in my house. <laughs> I have a book like that. You so can... if you ever want to study with me, I, I don't know any Turkish other than what I saw in grammar books. But um, I'd be happy to study together with you. I mean, I think that would be really neat. And I, I still am interested if you ever do like, I don't know if you're ever going to do like Hebrew videos on your channel, but if you're ever interested, I don't know if that, like you've been busy, so I don't know if you're doing that, but I, I was mean, interested if you were ever going to do that. Uh, You mean Hebrew language teaching videos? or? Yeah, I didn't know if you were going to do some basic videos or not on your channel or not. I, I'm not planning on it right now just because I'm too busy. I do, you know, I do have a series of interviews on the Inverted A channel that are in Hebrew. Um, that's a different issue. So maybe what would be easier is just if I do get a basic Turkish book, we could start talking about Turkish. We could do that. That might be easier. Yeah, that, that would be something that uh, I think both of us would be interested in. 
I mean, and I was kind of thinking it's cool because Kate seems to know about Turkish too. So if she ever wanted to just like chime in and tell us things that she knows about Turkish, like I'm kind of impressed how she picks up so many different languages. Yeah. Well, she's a linguist. Yes, she is definitely a linguist. But so anyway, yeah, I think I do want to eventually get around to learning a bit more Turkish. That is kind of my goal. I'm just doing it in kind of a organic sort of way. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's kind of how I'm working on Korean right now. I'm not, I don't have a grammar and I'm just, uh, just kind of picking it up. But I was really proud of myself the other day. It's a small thing, but I was watching a travel video in Turkey and I did recognize a few words that I heard people saying in the street, like Anya, Evet. I was just really proud of myself. That's probably not a big thing. That's probably like nothing to people that are studying the language. But for me, that was kind of big. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, it was fun. And you know, one reason I really, I mean, eventually, if I could afford it today, I'd go. I would love to go to Turkey because I hear there's a lot of really beautiful art there in the buildings, like in the churches and the mosque. And mm -hmm. just there's also some little museums and it's a very art centric city. So I'm very fascinated. I would love to visit if I had the opportunity. Are there any particular artworks in, that you want to visit that are in Turkey? I mean, I can't think of like a specific artwork per se, but let's just put it this way. Like some of the mosques have like beautiful windows and paintings. And here's another example. Haga Sophia has like the old Christian artwork and then like some of the mosque artwork that was added later and just some of the tile artwork. I just, I don't have like a specific thing that I want to see. I just kind of want to get a feel for the city itself because it's so beautiful and historic and it's lived through three empires. So the Roman, the Byzantine and the Ottoman. I think I might be forgetting another empire, but you know, it's just a very historic city. So I feel like that would be really fun to visit one day. Yeah, definitely. If I ever, if I ever traveled the world, I would want to visit there too. But I don't know that I'll ever leave my little enclave here. You know, and the one thing I was going to say, though, about the whole trip, it, it would be neat to travel, but I've met people before they did travel to other countries. And I'd ask them, oh, did you read about this or learn about that part of the culture? And they're like, I didn't know that happened in our country. And it just kind of surprised me because I'm like, oh, but they visited the country. So I kind of felt like if you're really interested in a culture, nowadays you can learn and experience a lot of it like one of my favorite things is just to watch travel videos on youtube and it's probably not the same but you still can get some exposure to it yeah my favorite way of traveling is actually living in a country for more than one year um and working there if you work there then you get to learn a little bit more about it than if you're just passing through I think the way you did it is probably the best way, for sure. That's probably the best way to do it. Yeah, but I only did it in one country, you know. So, and life is short and other things happen, you know. So it's hard to to see all the world. Well, maybe one of these days you need to do an updated video about your experience living in Taiwan. That might be interesting for people who are planning to live and work there that are expats? Probably other people who are currently there are more prepared to do that. And if I were to describe my experiences, they might not be current. You okay. Know, I understand. Yeah. I mean, things are changing every day. It seems like even here, I'm like, oh, there's a lot of change every day. Like, I'm like, oh, there's the train. <laughs> which might sound funny, but we never had a train here for about 50 years. So I'm like, oh, you better stop. There's a train coming. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. You need to be aware because even though there's a sound, it comes fast. They're testing that thing fast and it's not very secure the way that they have it all set. I'm like, okay, just make sure to cross right there. Not here. Well, uh, take care because 
yeah, th this kind of change can cause all sorts of problems. I think it will be bigger once it's officially going. I think right now with the testing phase. But anyway, yeah. So that was all I could contribute about things I've read or art or anything. Did you have any other things that you wanted to share? No, I think I think we covered a lot tonight, don't you? We really did. And I kind of meandered and I was a little bit rambly. But, you know, I do that sometimes. <laughs> Well, I went all over the place, too. But the, isn't that what our talks are about? Yeah, that's what I like to do. I like to talk about a little bit of everything. And I feel like art is definitely interconnected with all aspects of life, if you think about it. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, I guess we can say good night and w we'll do it again. And next, next Sunday... Um, We'll be painting on my channel and then talking on yours. Yes, we will. Okay, good night. Good night, Aya.